King Ahab was a pretty bad guy, at least according to the Bible, famously doing evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. First Kings describes Ahab worshipping Canaanite gods like Baal and Asherah, as well as running into conflict with the prophet Elijah. But most notoriously of all, he marries the evil Tyrian princess Jezebel, who ruthlessly persecutes worshippers of Yahweh, purging his prophets from the lands of Israel. But who was Ahab? To answer this question, we're actually going to start with his dad. King Omri, a man who founded the Omri dynasty, a line of kings that ruled the northern kingdom of Israel for about 50 years. Omri himself receives little attention in the Bible, other than a short paragraph that he was the sixth king of Israel, that he moved the capital city to Samaria, and that he also sinned more than all those before him. This pretty much summarizes the Bible's view of the Omrides, shining a very unfavorable light on him and his lineage. The Omrides were a line of idol worshippers who angered the Lord, the God of Israel. Ahab, his son, died in battle, shot by an archer, while Jezebel was thrown to her death from the palace window at Jezreel, and her body eaten by dogs. The whole dynasty ends in ruin with the usurper Jehu killing Ahab's son at Jezreel, along with the rest of Ahab's remaining family. While the biblical text tells of the Omrides' evils, it doesn't tell the whole story. Archaeological evidence suggests that the Omri dynasty was one of the most powerful political entities in the whole region, reigning over an era of economic prosperity and territorial expansion and marking a new chapter in the history of Israel. Let's start with Samaria, the new capital founded by King Omri. The site of Samaria, modern Sabastia, is located on a rocky hilltop in the Palestinian territory of the West Bank, around 65 kilometers north of Jerusalem. The Bible tells us that Omri bought the land and named the city he built, Samaria, after the land's previous owner. Excavations here have revealed that the site had been inhabited from the 11th century, but the earliest phase of monumental construction correspond to Omri's reign, dating to the early 9th century. Archaeologists discovered a huge palatial complex that they dubbed the Palace of Omri. It is absolutely massive, with foundations measuring approximately 55 by 40 meters. This palace is the largest monumental construction dating to the Iron Age in the Levant. Situated on the top of a hill, the location provided both a good vantage point of the plains below as well as allowing for the palace to be visible for some distance, which must have advertised the Omrides' strength. We also can see hints of their wealth and engineering skill. The walls were constructed using a technique called ashlar masonry, in which stones are cut into uniform shapes then laid in horizontal layers. The blocks of stone used for the construction for the Palace of Omri were fit together so well that no mortar was needed. A bunch of ivory decorations were also discovered during the early excavations of the site, which may have been used to decorate furniture. Kathleen Kenyon, one of the site's principal excavators in the early 1930s, identified these ivories as belonging to the so-called ivory house that the Bible says Ahab built, but reanalysis of both the site and Kenyon's excavation reports have called this into question. It's more likely that the ivories came from later layers, perhaps during the reign of King Jeroboam II. The founding of the Israelite capital at Samaria was a watershed moment for the Kingdom of Israel. Before, there were few settlements in the region. Those that did exist were small and scattered across the territory. But after its founding, the archaeological record reveals an expansion of villages, as well as the development of a road system connecting the highlands in Samaria with the coast. This road system connected the Sumerian highlands to lucrative trade routes, which helped the economy of the northern kingdom of Israel to flourish. The Omride kings were also apparently a regional military power. Let's return to the city of Megiddo as an example. As we talked about in episode 2, Megiddo was formerly a crowning jewel for the Canaanites. But now, a few hundred years later, it was a crowning jewel of the Omride dynasty. Two palaces at Megiddo have been attributed to the Omrides, as well as some pretty impressive fortifications. The emphasis on defensive fortifications at nearly every Omride site hints that they were ruling during pretty violent times. Check out this inscription. It's known as the Mesha Stele, named after the king of Moab mentioned in the inscription. It says Omri was the king of Israel, and he oppressed Moab for many days, and his son succeeded him, and he said, I too will oppress Moab. So Mesha describes a military conflict between Moab and a dynasty of Israelite kings led by Omri, and later his son, 
possibly Ahab. So we can surmise that Omri and his son not only led successful military campaigns in nearby Moab, but managed to occupy the territory for 40 years. There also is evidence for skirmishes between the Omrides and the Arameans to the north, based in Damascus. An inscription found at Tel Dan records the death of two Omride kings at the hands of the king of Damascus. In the text, the Aramean king states that the king of Israel entered previously in my father's land. Now, we're not sure exactly which king he's talking about, but it's clear that an Israelite king did attempt to infringe upon territory under Damascan control. A quick glance back at the locations of the Omride settlements reveals that, outside of Samaria, they are predominantly located on the borders of their territory, likely serving as points of military control. The Omrides also apparently fielded an impressive chariot force. An Akkadian inscription from the reign of the Assyrian king Shalmaneser III describes a battle fought at the city of Karkar between the invading Assyrian army and an alliance of smaller kingdoms, including King Ahab. The inscription says that Ahab committed 10,000 soldiers and 2,000 chariots to the battle, one of the largest forces mentioned in the inscription. From this evidence, archaeologists surmise that the Omrides must have fielded one of the largest standing armies in the whole region. So, how were the Omride kings able to expand their territories to such a degree, field such big armies, and sponsor such large-scale monumental constructions? Several factors likely contributed to these undertakings. First, their relatively big population, and second, their economy. Let's start with their population. Archaeological surveys have revealed that Omri and Ahab's kingdom was densely populated. Estimates place the population of the northern kingdom of Israel to around 350,000 people, three times bigger than the southern kingdom of Judah at the time. Such a large population allowed the Omrides to conscript a large workforce without messing with their agricultural output of olive oil and wine production, which was the backbone of the northern kingdom's economy. Olive oil presses dating to the Omride dynasty have been found all over the place, and an extensive complex of wine presses have been excavated at Jezreel. Some argue that the Kingdom of Israel was actually one of the major suppliers of olive oil to nearby Egypt and the Assyrian Empire, both of which lacked the conditions necessary for large-scale olive orchards. Another important source of revenue for the Northern Kingdom must have been horses. As discussed earlier, the Omrides must have fielded an impressive chariot force, which implies that horse breeding was a part of their economy as well. In the 8th century, well after Omride rule, Israel was the main supplier of Egyptian horses to the Assyrian Kingdom to the north, which suggests that under the Omrides, the breeding and rearing of war horses was already underway. Some scholars have suggested that Jezreel served as a breeding and training facility for these horses, and at Megiddo, archaeologists have discovered buildings that may have been stables. Although they were originally and erroneously attributed to King Solomon, later studies found that they actually date to the reign of the Omrides. The Omride dynasty lasted for less than 50 years, and yet, in many ways, it marked a turning point for the Kingdom of Israel. During this period, Israel established itself as a major military and economic power, extended its territory into neighboring lands like Moab. The might of the Omride kings is reflected in their numerous monumental constructions located throughout their region, as well as inscriptions from their neighbors. However, this golden age of the Northern Kingdom was not to last. A little over a century after the death of the last Omride king, political stability in Israel collapsed, and the lands that once belonged to the Northern Kingdom fell into the hands of the Assyrians. This left its neighbor to the south, the Kingdom of Judah, to face off against the Assyrian Empire all by itself. Stay tuned for what happens next. King Hezekiah of Judah versus the Assyrian King Sennacherib is next.